Welcome to the Healthcare Unfiltered Express, where I conduct short video interviews packed with relevant and timely information that you cannot miss. So sit back and enjoy the show. Matt Kurian, thank you so much, Dr. Kurian, for coming on the show. It's your first time on Healthcare Unfiltered, and we, we took the express route. Welcome to the show, buddy. Yes, thanks for having me, Chadi. It was it's, um, very excited to be here and um, talk about all the different updates within breast cancer and, and all the new drugs and options we have. I mean, it, it's exploding. I mean, there, there's there's so much, I think, that, you know, that from ESMO 2025, that we won't even scratch the surface just within this first, first 15 minutes, right? Yeah, and that's what I, I wanted. You know, it's it's very there's so much, right? I mean, we mm-hmm. you know we all know how overwhelming these conferences could be. So our mm-hmm. goal really is to kind of focus a little bit on things that are clinically relevant. As you know, our mutual colleague Dr. Sarah Sammons have been on the show, and we talked a little bit about several abstracts and papers that mm-hmm. she really found extremely interesting. Mm-hmm. And I thought I wanted you to focus a little bit more on kind of like. Are there new targets happening in breast cancer that are gaining traction? Are there new Mm -hmm. drugs that have piqued your interest from ESMO 2025? Putting that in context of current practice as well as within the abstracts that you saw that were interesting. So, So let's start. Yeah, I think that, you know, we can start, I think, with the the one that I think is the hot topic within breast cancer is really the next generation of oral surds, right? You know, and, and all of the estrogen degraders that are out there. And, you know, obviously we've heard a lot from ASCO, you know, about um, the Serena 6 study, you know, which was a very provocative study that that really looked at, you know, finding an ESR1 mutation potentially before radiologic progression and then acting on that um, when folks are potentially endocrine resistant as well too. And so I think that within this, this has just continued to explode. We have the Ember 3 with aluminestrant as well, too, as another oral surd. Our original oral surd was Elisestrant, you know, back um, approved with the Emerald study as well, too. But now we have other unique mechanisms of action, such as ProTac inhibitors that Erica Hamilton um, presented as well, too, um, in, in the past ASCO with Vegdegestrant. Um, and then we have other sort of uh, more novel endocrine options, such as uh, lasso floxacine and uh, abemocyclib and sort of these um, CIRM hybrids as well, too. And then we have other ones um, like endoxifen, um, you know, in the Evangeline study, um, you know, that um, our colleagues from, from Mayo lead as well, too. So I think that there's there's so many different options, I think, you know, within within oral surge. And I think within ESMO, you know, the, the ones that, you know, definitely stand out, I, I think, are you know, um, the Gerardestrin study, essentially, that, you know, Sarah has, has gone over already, um, and, and really looking at exactly, you know, what's your approach in terms of endocrine resistance? Is it an approach of a Serena 6 where you potentially can detect that ESR1 and act on that before someone develops radiologic progression? Again, it's something that has not really been done, you know, within our field um, in, in a very provocative design as well. And I think a lot of us are still um, feeling that it's early at this point. We need further sort of PFS2, further data, maybe overall survival, maybe even PFS3, which is something we traditionally don't look at, right, you know, as an endpoint. But, you know, we're, we're moving the needle now um, within that and, and trying to understand exactly how much benefit are we really seeing here or are we kicking the can down the road with an approach like that. Um, and there was a lot of, um, you know, interest in the uh, comparator arm of the Serena 6. So you, you have an approach like that where you're maybe a little bit more proactive. It's a very patient-friendly approach, right? So the most, um, you know, exciting data that came out of ESMO is we heard a little bit more about the quality of life data associated with the Serena 6 approach. And you can see, you know, we got sort of a glimpse at ASCO and saw that there was a um, significant improvement in the time to deterioration um, in terms of quality of life um, for these patients um, with a difference of, you know, almost 10 plus months in terms of um, pain and, and other um, significant symptoms that can be associated with the metastatic diagnosis. Um, and as a patient, if you put yourself in the shoes of a patient, 
you can see why this approach um, is something that a lot of patients would be interested. It's more of a proactive approach, right? It's a way to potentially decrease the um, number um, and um, of metastases that may develop sooner, right? Um, and it, it may keep you pain-free longer as well, too. So that is a very, very provocative study. And I think that we need more information. But I think if you talk to patients about it and some of our patient advocates, they're very excited by that approach as well, too. What in general, what is so unique about SIRDs? Like, you know, c- compared to the, you know, the, the SIRMs and the other one, like what's so, what's so special about them? Yeah. So I think that, you know, when we talk about why we are thinking about, you know, SIRDs, they're really not just estrogen blockers, but they destroy the estrogen receptor. Whereas all of our previous um, medications, you know, we've used for many years, letrozole and estrozole, other AIs really just decreased estrogen production, right? We've always focused on that, you know, and then in terms similar way with tamoxifen as well too. But this is a different way of overcoming ESR1 resistance. This is a selective pressure mutation that comes up as a result of using aromatase inhibitors. And this does not just block um, the signal. It destroys the receptor there. So it's a, it's a unique way of overcoming that um, and being able to potentially, you know, in the design of Ember 3 and others similar to that, adding a CDK4-6 to that and prolonging the ability for us to use CDK4-6 inhibitors, which we know work quite well overall. Um, you know, if you're thinking more of like an Ember 3 approach or um, similar approaches, and now there are many, many studies that are being looked at that are trying to understand exactly, you know, is that the right way to sequence things exactly, um, you know, in terms of using another CDK4-6 with some of these oral surges to sort of prolong um, that time to be able to use the CDK4-6 and prevent someone from being able to get closer to the use of chemotherapy. And that's what the whole goal and why there's such an explosion of different treatments that not are just, you know, ESR1 targeting, but also pic 3 ca P10, other things. These are all endocrine options, really, or endocrine resistant options to try to prolong that ability to prevent someone from having to use, you know, some of our other antibody drug conjugates now that are becoming more important as well, but um, to preserve quality of life is, is really what it comes down to. Yeah, that's great. So SIRDs, and you mentioned already the ESR, the pic 3 c and, and then the, um, the P, um, uh, which was the third target you just mentioned? Uh, P10, yep. And, and we have, um, you know, we what, have- what are, what are we treating? What, what are the specific drugs targeted to P10? Yeah, P10 and then the AKT pathway, um, you know, where we're, we're really looking specifically, you know, our only option at this point in time, you know, is uh, capacity assertive plus full best um, So that's really the one that, you know, we're, we're really focused on the most with the AKT um, pathway there that, um, you know, we, we have that option now for patients. Um, and it's maybe a little bit more downstream of that pick 3 ca pathway, uh, but targeting in a little bit of a different way. Um, and there hasn't been a, a lot of evolution, you know, in that space yet. But I think that most of the movement really, you know, is really within use of oral surds, how to sequence them. We have two, you know, additional trials we're still waiting on information from, um, with the Serena 4 being one of them as well, too. Um, and looking at using oral surds just up front, right? Instead of using an AI and the CDK4-6, right. we're talking about using that oral surd, which we know may work better in combination, um, you know, with CDK4-6 up front and maybe potentially even prolonging, you know, um, the, the ability for those folks to remain on CDK4-6 even longer, right? So those are unique studies that I think everyone is really waiting on to see the sequence of them. And then as I think within oncology, everything, you know, that we see moves from the stage four setting all the way down to the neoadjuvant setting. There are now very novel approaches looking at the neoadjuvant um, strategies, um, you know, and trying to understand exactly, for example, the Evangeline study that we're part of at St. Elizabeth's as well um, as a neoadjuvant study, um, looking at, um, you know, a, a, a novel, um, you know, molecule called endoxifen that is a um, breakdown product of, of tamoxifen, or metabolite of tamoxifen as well, and using it in a neoadjuvant setting, right? Um, and potentially seeing if we can, 
um, you know, potentially, you know, improve the rate of, of you know, PCR downstaging of tumors, um, you know, that traditionally hormone positive tumors and downstaging, unless you are younger, you know, and we're potentially pursuing chemo or you have a high oncotype, other things like that can be a difficult challenge sometimes. So there's a group of patients that don't maybe fit into that box that, you know, that we're, we're potentially doing chemo if they're not, you know, a, a younger patient as well, that we're trying to explore whether there's more novel endocrine therapy options like endoxifen, other oral surge, things like that, um, that we can use in the neoadjuvant setting. So I think that is actually, you know, something that I think will be very interesting to see exactly how those things play out and whether or not, you know, they, they aid us in, in potentially downstaging, improving breast conservation, um, other things like that. So I think it, it's a very unique time, I think, for oral surrogates. I think, you know, there, there's so many different things and they all trickle down from the metastatic sure, setting, I sure, think. Sure. Um, but I think there, there's a lot of, lot of hope within that. Let's move on from surrogates to something else before we run out sure. of time. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep going forever for that one. So, you know, I think the next one I think is, is what I like to call the ADC revolution, you know, and the payload war. Um, you know, I, do, I really, do you know, do you know, Matt, how many ADCs are under development? Oh, I mean, I, I think there's probably more than 200, I would say, you know, over in 800 ADCs. Yeah. It's crazy. So I, <laughs> it, it is the time of ADCs. And I, and I think that it, it is definitely something within, you know, the breast oncology field. We are now, having to make more decisions regarding sequencing, right? That's all what our conversations come down to. And the bottom line between anyone you talk to, we have a lot of retrospective data, but we do not have head-to-head -head data. So that makes it very difficult, you know, for, for oncologists, especially community oncologists, to be able to make some of these decisions exactly. Um, and so, you know, obviously, you know, TDXD has really been king, you know, across the board, you know, for her too low, or to positive disease um, and, and really, you know, shined within that. And obviously, you know, we've already discussed, you know, on your podcast earlier with Sarah, you know, regarding all the different Destiny Breast 05, Destiny Breast 11, Neoadjuvant, Adjuvant, Destiny, you know, um, you know, and metastatic setting, upfront setting. So there, there's so many uses of these antibody drug conjugates and sequencing is going to become extremely important and biomarkers are going to become extremely important, which we have a very poor understanding of as well, too. You know, at the same time, you know, we have trope two ADCs like sasituzumab being moved up in the frontline setting as well, too. We have DATO, DXD, you know, being added. It's another trope two ADC in the metastatic triple negative. It's interesting to see in ESMO how everyone sort of went back and forth between, you know, the, the trials between, you know, SG and DATO. And that'll be very interesting to say how exactly we play that out as well too. But there are other more unique um, mechanisms of actions that I think that, you know, um, that I'm quite interested in, you know, really within, um, you know, post TDXD exactly um, in the, in the HER2 positive setting, um, where do we go from there? Right. You know, um, our, our options, you know, are, are potentially a HER2 climb regimen. You could use TDM1, you know, within that, but then there are, you know, other more, you know, unique, um, or to uh, DXD, um, sanitatamib, um, hetero or HER2 heterodimerization um, targets as well, too. There's combination ADC plus IO um, combinations as well, too. So I think that what you're going to see really is um, an, an evolution in terms of, you know, us sort of phasing out a lot of the old chemotherapies that we use. But I think that we also have to be a little bit careful because sequencing one ADC after the other we know may not work as well either, right? Depending on the payload, the target of things, right? Paolo Tarantino does an excellent job discussing this exactly, that there's been a lot of retrospective analysis that he's done as well too, um, in terms of folks with the hormone positive disease that if they use TDXD followed by SG, you see that this second ADC typically right after the first ADC is a pretty short median progression-free survival. So it is something that, we may have to think about chemo sandwiches as an approach sometimes where we insert capecitabine or something else in between there. But also, you know, we we have to understand exactly what our biomarkers are that that drive those decisions exactly. And that's where I think we're we're trying to have a better understanding how that how that can help us. My hope is maybe that AI, proteomics, um, you know, 
functioning signaling, um, you know, uh, can help us sort of understand that a, a little bit better as well, too, um, and understanding exactly what drugs are, um, you know, the ones that we should use. There's also other, um, you know, interesting CDK2, CDK7 inhibitors as well, too, that may be a resistance pathway um, to CDK4-6 inhibitors as well, too. Um, you know, there, there's two potential, you know, molecules that, that are out in the market as well, too, that are being explored in early phase studies. I'm um, trying to understand exactly, you know, whether or not they can potentially prevent luminal endocrine escape as well, too. And maybe for folks that, you know, potentially post CDK4-6, exactly if you're hesitant to recycle CDK4-6s, which many oncologists are, even with some of these strategies, exactly. Um, these are more novel approaches, um, you know, they think we're looking into. And then you talk about other things like FGFR, 2B directed therapies, um, you know, that are uh, new uh, or to um, hormone positive and really sort of a subset of endocrine resistant um, hormone positive tumors where there's um, you know, different, um, you know, molecules um, that potentially could improve responses within that select um, niche of, of folks as well, too. And then, um, you know, really exactly, you know, how do we sequence, you know, if you're not doing a combination of IO and ADC as well, too, you know, how do you how do you sequence these things if you're using IO up front and ADC versus, you know, potentially platinum versus an IO as well, too. So that is something that I think will be very interesting overall. So there's so many things, I think, yeah. you know, that within so, the field. Matt, let me ask you a question just in the few minutes that we have left. Um, sure. Po post ESMO 2025, mm -hmm. are there biomarkers that you were not checking for before ESMO 2025 that now mm -hmm. you will, and you're going to talk to the pathologist or you're going to order it like with the NGS company, whoever it is. Are there certain biomarkers, certain genes, certain targets post ESMO 2025 that you are going to look for when it takes care, when you're taking care of a patient with breast cancer that you weren't doing before? Yeah, you know, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I think that um, we're having more and more of an understanding regarding is that, you know, ESR1 fusion mutations or something that are were thought to be fairly rare, and they are overall fairly rare. But I, I do think that, you know, when you talk about fusion proteins as well, too, and, and understanding that, you know, you have to understand that, you know, infusions are better detected on RNA NGS as well, too. And so a lot of times if, if one is ordering just DNA NGS, you know, then you, you may not be able to detect some of these fusions potentially. Um, and again, that is actually very important for understanding because a lot of the data we have regarding oral SIRDs um, does not is not does not include ESR1 fusions, and the thought is actually when an ESR1 fusion protein can um, can show itself, it essentially you know eliminates the um, ligand binding domain, and essentially the thought is these um, oral certs may not even work at all, right? You know, within the, so it's actually a very important thing <clears throat> to know that many folks may not know exactly. But and you know, were not doing this before. You were not checking this before. You know, so I, I think that across the board, I think that most of us probably do DNA NGS. A lot of times I've already sent, you know, RNA mm -hmm. NGS if I have the tissue, but I don't know if that's standard across most institutions or not, because again, that, that takes more time, that takes more tissue um, within that as well, too. Um, you know, other things that I think that, you know, will be interesting to see will be that FGFR um, 2B overexpression, you know, that can be seen in some of those endocrine resistant um, you know, uh, tumors as well. And, and that's something that I had not routinely done, but it is something I think that, you know, would maybe be sort of the comparison of like a new HER2 for hormone positive endocrine resistance. So I think that's something I've not typically done, but yeah. definitely something that I think could be, you know, uh, an interesting thing to see overall. And then I think, you know, other things I would say, you know, I, I think that the HER2 ultra low is something that I think I would say most of us have probably moved to doing already now, I would say within most centers, but I, I've talked to some colleagues that still have, are not doing that routinely within their pathology departments as well too. Um, so that's something that I think as the data grows for using, you know, TDXD within the ultra low setting, I think that's something that's going to become more of a commonplace thing, I think overall. Yeah. I need to do one podcast just on her too. For yes. Sure. So I, 100%. Um, I think, I think that is definitely something that we need to book, rely on. Better. Book your spot. We'll do that in January after uh, yeah, San Antonio. Yeah. So, Matt, uh, Dr. Matt Kurian, thank you so much for coming on Healthcare Unfiltered Express. Lots of new targets, lots of new drugs for breast cancer post-ESMO 2025. Thank you so much. Of course.
Thank you for listening to this edition of the Healthcare Unfiltered Express. Until next time, take care.